Uh, welcome, church. Let's go to today's text in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. And before we read the text, uh, let me uh, pray for us. Uh, Father, we come before you uh, in the name of your Son, Jesus. And Father, we have gathered uh, as a church that has been scattered and also as families, Father. Father, families whom you have blessed to know your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit will fall upon every room and upon every heart that is listening and that Jesus, your name may be glorified. And that Father, that you will strengthen your people with faith that we have in your son and which comes from your word, Father, at this time, God, that we may not be a people who are shaken by the winds and the storms, Father, but we may be a people who are found to have built on rock, on obedience to your word with faith in Jesus Christ, that we may bring glory to your name and we may shine the light of Jesus onto the nations in this desperate and dark hour, Father, during a time in which many people need hope, Father. Help us to be a people whose hope is founded in you and who shine that hope to others, Father, that your name may be glorified. We love you, Father. Would you speak your word today? Meet people in their homes, in their rooms, with their families, Father. Strengthen us for your glory. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived as she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Today I want to bring the word of the Lord to you from your homes and uh, with your families. And the title that we have given this message is, I am pregnant. I am pregnant. In order to further expound on this idea, I want to take us to the book of James, the book of James chapter 1 verses 13 through 15. If you can turn there quickly with me, turn with me, but if not, allow me to read it for you. In the book of James chapter 1 verses 13 through 15, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But when each person is tempted, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, but, but I'm sorry, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Today I want to talk to us about the, the, the topic of I am pregnant. And if I could give this an extended title, I will call it I am pregnant, unchecked desires. I am pregnant, unchecked desires. As we are at home, as we are spending time with families, it is not a time to be spiritually in slumber. It is not a time to be spiritually lax. I believe this is a great time that God is speaking to the church, God is stirring up the church, God is doing something in the church and among the church, God is purifying the church. And it is during this time, as we will see today, that sin can very easily creep into our midst when we are very lax. And so today, um, using these texts, I just want to quickly touch on the two major um, ideas that I want to expound on, which is, first, 
desire, and secondly, sin. So in the book of James today, it talks about each person being tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Now you and I have desires, and not all desires are bad. In fact, God himself has desires, and you and I have desires because we are made in the image of God. Uh, The Buddhist would say, get rid of your desires. And God says, instead of fulfilling your desires with things that that I have not created you for, with sin and, and, and things that are unclean and unholy, God says, I want to turn your desires to desire the things that are right. And we, we desire, humans desire, because we were created in the image of God. For God himself desires, Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God is a God who desires. 1 Timothy 2.4 God is a God who desires all people to be saved and come to, know the, come to the knowledge of the truth. God is a God who desires. But today we're going to look at the story of David to see how desire gets corrupted without diligence, without us checking our desires. Desires can become corrupted. And in the book of James today, that these, this desire, when it has gift, conceived, gives birth to Sin, and we're going to see that in the life of David today. Now, what is sin? We, 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 we talked about desire, desires, passions, desires, what you want. Sin is, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, lawlessness. The Bible says everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know, and at our church, we are reading the book of Judges. And I love the book of Judges because I think it gives a very pointed description of a people living, fulfilling their desires, unchecked um, and wanton desires and living in sin. For in the book of Judges, the time is described and the people are described as in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And essentially this is lawlessness. It is living outside the will and the law of God. It is doing whatever we want to do. It is living not under the law, the law of God, but under the law of our own selfish desires or the will of man. And obviously some of the most obvious lawless deeds that we church folk like to talk about are abuse of drugs, sexual immorality, drunkenness, adultery, all sorts of things that you and I like to talk about when we talk about people outside of the world. But But actually, when you and I understand lawlessness in a deeper way, we see that Jesus was not only concerned about the behavioral problems of sin, but Jesus was concerned about the motivations and the goals which exist as corrupt things in the human heart, which actually is what sin is all about. So sin is not just about wrongful behavior, but it is a corruption in the heart of man. Jesus says this in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. In other words, sin is not just a behavior. Sin is not just an action. Sin is not just a verb. Sin is this corruption that is found within the heart of man that produces all kinds of corrupt and evil behaviors. This is why Jesus was more concerned with the hearts of the Pharisees than with the behavior of the prostitutes. In fact, Jesus would look at the Pharisees and would say to the Pharisees that the prostitutes and the uh, the tax collectors get into the kingdom of God before you. Why? Because Jesus looked at the the, the the Pharisees and the law, lawmakers and the scribes, people who looked pristine and good and very churchy on the outside, but their hearts were full of sin. And this is what Jesus said to them. Woe to you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and Lawlessness, dear friends, this is sin as Jesus defines it. 
behavior that is informed by the corruption of the heart. This is sin. And so today, as, as we go into the text, we, we, we need to have these two broad concepts in mind. It is human desire, being corrupted by sin, and, and being, being corrupted by, by our sinful nature. When, when, when you and I live by our base and broken desires, what that leads into is a sinful life, a, a festering of, of sinful and broken desires in our hearts, lawlessness in our hearts. And the Bible says that sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you or its desire is to consume you, to take over you. But you must rule over it. Now today we're we're talking about sin because in today's text, in today's story, we see an incredible man, a man called a man after God's own heart, falling into a deep, dark sin. It is not an understatement to say that this is one of the most defining moments of David's life. If you study the Bible, you see up until this point the rise, the ascension, the coronation, the coming into power of a man named David. And after the events of chapter 11 and chapter 12, after Bathsheba becomes pregnant, after David impregnates her, after this great and egregious sin before God, the life of David finds itself in a great decline. And from this, you and I simply understand that even a great man, a great man of God, a man whom God calls a man after God's own heart is susceptible to sin. He is vulnerable to sin. I mean, I mean think about it. Who, who was David? In fact, many of you watching this video right now are named David. And just by the sheer number of the Davids that are watching this video, Korean Americans love to name their children David. Just by the sheer number of Davids watching this video and the Davids that are running around in the church, you and I understand what kind of man this man was. I mean, this was a man after God's own heart. This was a shepherd boy turned king. Because the Lord looked upon his heart and found something in his heart that Saul did not have. Here is a hero, a warrior, a slayer of Goliath, about whom the entire nation of Israel shouted, Saul has struck his thousands and David, the young man, his ten thousands. He was a runaway, a runaway, a vagabond, a criminal, an outlaw, but God was with him and repeated throughout First Samuel, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with David. The Lord was with David. David was a leader of men. For when he was running away from Saul, the Bible says everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to David and he became a commander over them. Wow, what a leader. He would go around. He would fight the Philistines. He would rescue the Israelites. And in many ways, David was a very honorable man. In the way that he dealt with Saul, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. In the ways that he dealt with his men, when his men wanted, when part of his men went to war, part of his men stayed with the baggage, and he refused to let the men who fought the battle keep all the loot, for he said we must share with the men who stayed with the baggage. The way that King David, when he comes into power, deals with both his enemies and his and his friends alike. The way that he reacts to Saul and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul's death, his treatment of Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. I mean, in, in many ways, in, in so many different aspects, David is a great man. And the Bible teaches us that David loved the Lord his God. If there's one point of contrast between David and Saul, it was that, the, that David loved God. You see this in his dance before the Lord when the ark came home to Jerusalem that he danced with all of his heart, his might. We see this when David desired to build the temple of the Lord to which God responds, actually, I will build you a house. And, and so in so many respects, and, and of course, in, in post-David history in Israel's kingdom, we, we read of God 
repeating over and over and over again whether or not a king was like David or not. He constantly compares kings to David because God loved David and David was a great man and, and David was a man of God. But for all of his accomplishments, for all of the favor that David had, for all of the spiritual might and the spiritual victories that David experienced, David too, like you and I, was a sinner. And he was greatly susceptible to sin, perhaps because he was so spiritually victorious. And according to the very words of David himself in Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to park just for a second here and ask, ask you this question. Do you know that you are a sinner? Do you know that you are a sinner? I must communicate this point because so many people know in their heads that they are sinners, but not in their hearts. Their hearts do not cry out for a savior. Their hearts do not cry out for Christ. Their hearts do not need God because they have not yet fully understood that they are sinners. And let me tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, if a man like David, whom God himself called a man after my own heart, would be able to will, be willing to confess that I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin that my mother conceived me, then it ought to give us pause to realize right now where we are at. We are indeed sinners, broken in many ways, in need of grace. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes you, that includes me. That includes all the heroes and the heroines that we look up to in the Bible. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We need a savior. And I believe today's text is so illustrative of the brokenness of David. For in this sin, his entire life turns. And I want to address that today because God, as scripture is written for our learning and for us to learn from the mistakes of people in the past, uh, I want us to look at just how sin strikes because sin struck David when David was not expecting it. So, so to turn with me today to 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, chapter 11 in today's text. The Bible says, that in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job and his servants with him and all Israel. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. You know, before we dive into the desire portion of the text. As you and I are quarantined in our homes, as we are spending time in our rooms, one thing I want to note is that sin thrives and sin often finds us when we find ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. David should have been out fighting the battle as a king does in the time of spring. But in his spiritual victory and in his spiritual laxity, he found himself at home in spring, the time the people or the kings go out to war. Wrong place, wrong time. And with this, I want to point a couple of things out. Number one, there are some of us quarantined right now. You, there's not many places you can go. You could be saying, what do you mean wrong place, wrong time? I'm, I'm at home. I'm stuck at home. But... Even at home, you could be at the wrong place at the wrong time. For example, you should be out with your family in the living room, but instead, you are in your room being tempted by the screen to watch things that you know that you don't want to watch, or maybe you know that you want to watch, but you know that you don't really want to watch because you are at the wrong place at the wrong time. See, you should be with your family, you should, you should, be, uh, uh, you should be doing something else, but, but you are, you're caught in the wrong place in the wrong time, and this leads to sin. And one thing I want to note about 
what David is going through is that David is supposed to be doing something, but instead of doing that thing which would please God and which would be an obedience to God, David finds himself doing nothing. And in this season, I want us to be very careful because we could waste this season, we could be lazy this season. I'm talking to many of my students online right now and many students are telling me that they are bored. Ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, you cannot be bored. Allow me to make that emphatic statement. Why? Because you are living on borrowed time. And if you are living a bored life, then you have not understood the value of time which God has purchased for you by the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I are living on borrowed time. And because you and I are living on borrowed time, and because you and I have been, by by grace, we have been saved to live on this borrowed time for God's glory, it is not that you and I could be lazy during this time and do nothing, just just like David, at the springtime when kings go out to battle, David stayed and did nothing. No, you and I ought to be fighting, engaging in the battles, engaging in our spiritual disciplines, engaging in prayer, engaging in family time. Whatever God wants you to do at this time is what you ought to be doing. When you are not engaging in what God wants you to do, then you will find yourself vulnerable to sin just as King David does here, right here, right now, in the comforts of his own palace. Protected and surrounded by his walls, David finds himself more closer to death. He finds himself closer to sin than when he was out there in the wilderness, in the discomfort of all that's going on in the wilderness, in the discomfort and the dangers of battle. He finds himself more vulnerable. Why? Because he is not actively engaged in what the Lord wants him to do. He is vulnerable. Wrong place, wrong time. But that's more of an obvious lesson, isn't it? I mean, we've all heard this passage preached before. We know that David was at the wrong place at the wrong time. But today, I want to touch on something a little more subtle in the text. Hence, my title, I Am Pregnant. Because up until this point, David finds himself wrong place and wrong time, but, but he does not have to make this choice to sleep with Bathsheba. He does not have to make this choice to sleep and to take this woman. For the Bible goes, Bible goes on, the Bible says that he inquired about the woman, found himself her beautiful, he inquires about the woman. Naturally, kings at this time had many wives and, and we're gonna touch upon that a little late, later. He finds out that she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite later, we will find out in scripture, was one of David's mighty men, one of David's closest confidants. Great friend of David, loyal to David, a loyal soldier, a loyal servant, a loyal friend. And yet David, after finding out, after the fact that he discovers that this is the wife of one of his loyal men, he sent messengers, took her, she came to him, he lay with her. Can you imagine the time, from the time that he discovers that this is the wife of Uriah, to the time that she comes into the door, David has all this time to change his mind, to reconsider, to think about what he is about to commit, but he does not. Why? For the people who have studied David and who know the story of David, perhaps this does not come as a big of a surprise. For David was a man after God's own heart, But he was not a perfect man. And one of David's vices, as you and I read in scripture, very subtle, but still there, was that he had an appetite for women. He had an appetite for beautiful, desirous women. And the Bible tells us of all the names of the wives of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, Abigail, the widow of Nabal, Ahinoam, Maka, Hagith, Abithal, Egla. David took women whom he desired, whom he found beautiful. Now at this point, it must be noted that just because God allowed polygamy and just because God allowed kings to have multiple wives, it does not mean it pleased God. For God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Susanna and Joanne etc 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 and Jesus himself says that this is what marriage was all about one wife one woman 
And so King David already is living outside of God's original design. In other words, the fruit of David's sin with Bathsheba were the results of seeds planted long ago in seeds of unbridled and uncontrolled desires. Let me say that one more time. In other words, the fruit of David's sin, the sin that we find David stuck in right now, the quagmire of of dilemma and sin that David finds himself in with Bathsheba and Uriah, were not a a result of just sudden burst of passion, but a, a series of passions and a series of desires that were left unaddressed, unchecked, and those seeds of unbridled desires bears the fruit of disaster in his encounter with Bathsheba. And that is where I look to James today. For the Bible says in the book of James, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God himself cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself tempts no one. In other words, God doesn't have any wrong desires. But for us, so we are fallen creatures. We are different. We have base desires. And the Bible says that, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. When he is seduced by his own desires. Mm. By his own desires. You know, a lot of people would look at Bathsheba and will say, well, maybe Bathsheba was complicit in this. Maybe she, she, maybe she, why didn't she resist, etc. And you can go into all sorts of crazy kind of arguments. But the Bible is clear at the end of the day, it was not Bathsheba. It was that the person who is, and David in this case, is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. You know, I love a story of Billy Graham. Billy Graham, one day he was preaching in France. And he preached in France and he went to his hotel and this was when I believe his ministry was just taking off and he preached in France and he went to a hotel and he opened his room and in his room was a beautiful naked woman in bed. Someone had planted her there to try to take a picture or to catch him in the wrongdoing. And you know what Billy Graham did? He slammed the door, he ran out, and he ran, and and according to the story, he ran all the way across the countryside. Just ran, just ran and ran and ran because he was so scared. Why? Because it's not about the person that is throwing themselves at you that gets you to sin. No, you are lured and enticed by his own desires. Even if Bathsheba came running up to David naked in the fullness of disclosure of her greatly known beauty, if David was not enticed by his own desires, David could have ran. David would have resisted. David would have clothed her, just like Billy Graham. But David did not. And many of us do not. You know, many of us, when we sin, we blame the computer, we blame our wives, we blame our children. We blame that woman or that boy or that man. We blame that circumstance. We blame our parents. We blame our grandparents. We blame Donald Trump. We blame Obama. We blame the system. We blame everybody. But the Bible says that actually, actually, sin is birthed when you and I are enticed and lured by our own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth Death. And that is where I come to the, 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 the statement of I am pregnant today. Because David lays with her, he takes her, and the Bible says the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. And I think this I am pregnant statement is significant because metaphorically it relates us right back to the book of James. Then desire when it has conceived, it is pregnant, impregnating language. Desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin. In other words, desire as it matures, as it matures in the places that is not supposed to, 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 to mature, as, as it, it's inseminated, as you give life to your desires, what it, what the life that it brings forth within the womb of your soul is sin. It is sin. And therefore, when you and I fight sin, it's not just that you and I must sin or not sin. No, we have to check our desires. What are our desires? Because desires, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Desire, sin, death. That's the pattern we see in Scripture. 
What are your desires right now? What are the deepest longings of your heart? We have to be honest because King David, for the man of God he was, had an unbridled passion for women in his heart, desire to take that which was beautiful. And it gave birth to a great sin. It caused his life to stumble and, and tumble down a path that I'm sure no one ever saw King David going, going down. Why? Unbridled desires. <clears throat> and so how do we respond to this? For I am pregnant. You are pregnant too. We are pregnant with desires. Desire when he has conceived, when he has been impregnated, brings forth, this, brings forth sin. And many of us in this room right now, as we are listening to, to, to the word of God being preached, we have desires in our hearts that have been unchecked and unbridled. I am pregnant. Let's be honest right now. I am pregnant. Pregnant with desires that should not be. So how do we respond to this? You know, this pregnancy leads to a death. In chapter 12, Verse 15, Prophet Nathan rebukes David. And in verse 14, it says, the child who is born to you shall die. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Desire, when it's fully conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. And the child sadly becomes a consequence of sin. But there's another child born, born because God is gracious. And to Bathsheba is born Solomon, named Jedediah, the beloved of the Lord. But ladies and gentlemen, I do want us to point, I do want to point to you to the pregnancy that is most profound and important in Scripture. When the Virgin Mary had to tell Joseph, I am pregnant. The first pregnancy in the world unlike every other pregnancy because every other pregnant person and every other pregnancy must confess in sin my mother bore, my mother bore me just like king david confesses in iniquity i was born i was born in sin because my father is a man and my mother is a woman but there is one pregnancy in the bible not born of sin not born out of human desire but born of god born of the father and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, who comes from the line of David, who comes from the line of Bathsheba, who comes from the line of Solomon, whom they called Emmanuel, God with us, who was both Jesus himself, who was both Jedediah, the fulfillment of Jedediah, the beloved of the Lord, and also the fulfillment of the poor child who died as a consequence for our sins. Why? Just like David's son died. Why? Because Jesus on the cross would bear the sins of the world to die for our sins because God so loved the world. And as the son of God, he was the only child born in this world whose sole purpose was to die because someone had to pay for the sins of David. Someone had to pay for the brokenness of Bathsheba. Someone had to pay for my sins and your sins. Someone has to pay for the sins that are born out of our broken desires. And that someone is Jesus. And when Mary confessed, I am pregnant, it was God saying, I'm going to reverse the curse that humanity has lived in. Desire giving birth to sin, sin bringing forth death. I'm going to enter into that death. I'm going to take care of that sin and I'm going to come into the heart of man to change your very desires at the core of who you are. I will put my spirit within you. And as, you change, as I change your desires by my spirit, by my son, you will love me, you will worship me, you will walk in my ways, no longer to live in sin but to live in righteousness. No longer to taste the fruit of death, but to eat of the fruit of life. And Jesus, 
in Jesus. In Jesus. And so today, I just want to give a couple applications. What are your desires like? Where are you with your desires? Check them. Really check them before the Lord. Be honest before the Lord. That's one of the most important things that I believe that we can do at this time. Come before the Lord. We have a lot more time than we did before. Or rather, most of us do. And I believe God's giving you this time to seek His face without the comforts of being in a religious setting, without the medicating presence of a pastor or someone preaching at you. God is really challenging you to seek His face. And I believe as you do, He wants to check your desires. Why? Because unchecked desires lead to sin. Secondly, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, come to Him today. Whoever, if you are watching right now and you are like David, you are a sinner, you are broken, I'm telling you right now that God gave His one and only Son, born through a virgin, so that he, that he could reverse the curse in your life, so that He could forgive you of your sins, He could free you from the power of sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose again on the third day. He is the Lord and Savior of this world, especially of those who believe. And if you repent of your sins right now, if you're willing to confess and believe in your heart, confess in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. God will put His Holy Spirit in your heart in your life and God will change your very desires. You could be free of sin today. And lastly, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, I want to remind you of Psalm where it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, he will change the desires that are within your heart. He will give you new desires. As you and as I seek God, I believe God wants to replace our desires so that we're not going to fall into sin as David did, but that we could live with renewed desires, renewed passions in the Lord, even at a time such as this. And that is what I want to pray for you right now. Would you close your eyes with me? At this time, wherever you are at, if you do not know Jesus Christ, but you want to repent of your sins, sin which ultimately will lead you to death, desire which leads to sin, sin which leads to death. But before you die and before death strikes your life, God is calling out to you. He is gracious and Jesus tasted that death for you. If you're in your room right now and you have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've never surrendered your life to him, if you've never asked him for the forgiveness of your sins, if you've never turned your life over to Jesus, I'm gonna invite you right now to turn your life over to Christ. Would you do that by uh, placing your hand on your heart or lifting both of your hands? Show a sign of surrender to God. It's between you and Him now. I'm going to pray for you in just a second. And then secondly, for all my brothers and sisters out there, would you put your hand on your heart? And I just want to pray for our hearts right now, that our desires may be purified and cleansed before the Lord, that we may be called men and women after God's own heart because our desires are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, right now, I pray for every single person watching this on video. Father, you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to heal a broken world. And for many of us who've been li living with our base desires, living in sin, bringing forth death in our lives, and headed towards destruction, God, would you reveal your son, Jesus Christ? And at this moment, Father, right now, would you save those who are putting their faith in you? We believe that you are, Father, because you're a good God and you are true to your promises. So, Father, I thank you for everybody who's placing their trust in Jesus Christ right now. I know that you're forgiving them, that you're saving them. Father, would you deposit your spirit within in them and help them to walk in your ways. And, Father, next, I just want to pray for all of our brothers and sisters out there. Father, renew our desires. As we delight in you, give us desires of your heart, Father God the desires of your heart. May we be called men and after your own heart because we live with your desires. Father, we love you. We thank you. May we be pregnant with the desires, the passions that you give unto us. We love you, Father. We thank you. We bless you for there's none like you. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.